Ferrari thinks it's selling way too many cars. GM hires back some old retirees. And Jaguar tells Gen Y to bugger off. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 195 for May 10th of 2013. True luxury cars have nothing to do with technology. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. John, how are you? I'm doing great, man. And we're welcoming two special guests. Yeah. The man who knew too much. And still does. Mr. <laughs> Jim Hall. And Hi, guys. The, and the esteemed Todd Lawson. And we should give the plug. Good to be here, Peter. Jim Hall with 2953 Analytics. Yes. Let's get the plug in. And, and Todd, of course, with uh, Automobile Magazine. Thanks, so, John. Good to have the both of you here. Yeah. Good to be here. Okay. We'll flip a coin. Where do we start? You, you, you start. Me start? Okay, well, I spent the week, uh, yesterday I was down in San Antonio, Texas, driving the new Chevy Silverado. Are you sure? Am I sure that I was It was driving? the new Silverado. <laughs> and that's what we need to talk about, is the styling of that truck, because it sure do look like the old one. Once you got inside, you knew it was the new Silverado. And once you start driving it, oh, too. Yeah. You're, no, look. It's, it's a, a much improved vehicle. There's no doubt about damn it. damn yeah. good truck. I like it's not just did. much improved. It's I damn good. I like what they did with the door. The door's different. You know, it's different. Yeah. Better. But, but it's one of those details that a lot of customers are not going to see it. They just it won't register. Um, the, the thing is that when you see things, there's, a, there's a, this visual hierarchy. When you see things, there's certain things you see first. And it's why we can identify human beings easily and computers have a harder time of it. But one of the first things is graphics. And the thing is, from the front, the graphics are... The in, same. They're, they're, they're highly evolutionary. Now, the truth is, Fords are, too. Ford's graphics are, too. But Ford has the, the thing where they'll do a graphic on a Super Duty, and they'll throw it on a 150. So the two 150s look more alike. Okay. okay. Now, you can't... You can look at this picture, but you can't say anything. So I'll ask Peter and Todd. And we've got a, a 2013 and a 2014. Which is which? One on the right is the 2014. Yeah. Okay, you guys. And you know what? Um, Jim's right about the uh, about the heavy duty Ford versus the light duty. Uh, applying those graphics, to me, you've got a little bit of that in the 2014 Silverado, and that's what truck designs become lately. It's in your face. The the thing about a truck, when you think about it, you want the badge bigger than any belt buckle J.R. Ewing could ever have worn, okay? You want these things obsequiously large, and everything about them is overstatement. And in that respect, on the Highline trucks, they've done a good job because they are just a festival of chrome or chrome plastic. And it's a truck. What are you going to do with it regarding styling? You can't do a 73 Chevy truck every, every generation. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's what it needs to be. It's a, it's a much better truck, as you point out. It is. Uh, they're, able it is. To, uh, they're, they're, they're able to compete with the uh, EcoBoost Fords uh, with their fuel economy on the 5.3 V8. Uh, you know, I think they've got a pretty Back credible... In fact, they claim, I think, a mile per gallon yeah, better than I the think all the truck numbers are bogus, though. I really do. Well, sure. I, I just don't. Well, I the, think the they're EPA the numbers least, are bogus, but you're right. The truck are the least, least connected accurate. to the numbers. Yeah. yeah, least connected. That's a good way to put it. I just think it's fantasy. You hey, know. Ben, do you got a picture of the Sierra, the GMC Sierra? Because I think they've done a much better job from a styling standpoint. They, they, they moved a little bit farther away from where they were before in that respect. But, but the thing is, there's a point at which don't you want when you yeah, bring here, it? Here, look, here, here's the GMC. And it, to me, that's just got more presence. I, I look at that and I go, oh, that's got to be the new one. Mm -hmm. Well, the previous generation GMC had more presence than the Silverado. Yes. In fact, it's funny because if you looked at the front end on the Silverado and you looked at the front end on the Suburban because they had different front sheet metal, there was an argument that the front, the front sheet metal on the Suburban was actually stronger sheet metal. It, it had more character. It, used, it read more. The, the Silverado, it looked like the headlights were always too small for the graphics of the car, and it's like, it, eh, I don't know. The GMC was stronger. And, and the thing is, this GMC is taking that, that hexagonal form they're doing, and they're putting it everywhere. You know, it's on the wheel bulges. It's on the headlights. It's on the grill. Good. God bless them. Yeah. See, since the original Dodge Ram, back when it was a Dodge, uh, the, only, the only truck that really went really out of, out of its way to be different regarding styling was the next 
the, the Ford F-150 that followed that up. And remember, it was the PN, the PN-96. Yes. That was sort of... It was It was soft. It was It was, it was, rounded. It was a girly truck. Yeah. They made a yeah. mistake. They did. Yeah. So we'll just make them bigger. That's all you need to do. I mean, forget it. It's truck styling. What, what are you going to do? And the next Ford coming based on the Atlas. The right, yeah, the Atlas I mean, is obviously... It's, yeah. It's awesome. It is awesome. And people will look at that and they'll go, whoa, that's the new but, one. But they never should have showed it. At the no, I agree. Absolutely yeah, right. Never. Well, you know why they showed it. I know it because you know they had to you know be there but you know it's just like never should have showed it guys just keep it under wraps but the auto shows are deteriorating into these things that are apparently for anybody that blogs we have to let everybody see it early a car company should say look the first time you're going to see the cars the shows here's your I've been, stuff I've been go and run just for, do it i've been saying that for yeah. 10 years yeah and you know now that all the magazines have websites you know if i was a cmo i'd say you know this is the launch date this is the preview date Oh, well, when is the long lead? No, there are no long lead dates. There's one date. Mm -hmm. That's when you'll see the car. Yep. Do the way the, the Europeans do it and, and have the drive actually a week or two before the auto show. Right. And make a big splash there, mostly for the public. I actually wish Corvette would have done that, too. They should have not let anyone see the car. Uh, no, I agree. That, Look, that I, show that night. There's but. no way you can surprise people if they've already seen it. Yep. Yeah. You've leaked stuff out, and, you know, people have had a time to soak, and then somebody else does pull something else new out, and they dominate the show. Yeah, yeah. But another thing that amazed me about the, the Silverado, and I, I knew this in the back of my mind, but it only hit me when they did the presentation. You know, we'd say... Oh, we make cars and trucks out of steel. Well, no, we make them out of steels. There's five different kinds of steel in the Silverado, and they're looking at a sixth. And, you know, it, to me, it just shows how sophisticated this industry is that's literally invisible to the public. Because five totally different grades of steel to be able to make this thing work is amazing. But not just unimportant to the public, irrelevant. I mean, it really is. It is. Did you? You well, saw then. You saw the uh, special edition down in San Diego. You, you mean the the high end one? Yeah. yeah. They're calling it the high country. Right. So I mean, and, and that's very interesting because, you know, at GM they thought, well, GMC, that's that's the high end brand, and and Chevrolet can't do see, high end see, trucks. GM, GM's totally whatever they say is just total BS because. They can't even stick to it within their own company. I mean, they, yeah, the, GMC was supposed to be the, the well, premium. Yeah, but this whole concept of premium truck was something GMC never, they never could define it, ever. It was hilarious. I had friends that worked on the advertising account, and they're like, I'm sorry, what does it mean? Well, it's like a Viking stove. No, I need something that's automotive relevant, not that it's like a Viking stove. But, Jim, it's a professional grade, which oh, that I was guess makes the uh, Chevy's amateur, huh? I don't know. They, what is professional? I, that's I like one of the worst mark. I don't think it's worked. Ever. Even though GMC is, is relatively successful. And, it's in spite but of. But it's kind of in, invisible. Yeah, the professional grade, they need to just can that. They it doesn't, it never it. meant anything. They never put meaning behind it. And the, the funny thing well, was. they tried to, but they, but, didn't, but they, they never did it. They, they couldn't explain it themselves. A Denali is not a premium grade. It's, it's basically a faux Escalade. <laughs> a mofo escalator. A mofo escalator, absolutely. So and, how's this new Chevy ver version? How's the new high-end Chevy as it is? It, look, it, it's like... Uh, is it Denali-esque or what? Oh, no. It's, it's Festival of, bay, of, of rugged brown leather. It's, it's a King Ranch type vehicle. Yeah. But it's or, not as... I, I like the leather in the King Ranch. I mean, that is no, I'm saying saddle it's, leather. But it's going for that kind of a thing. It is. The same as the Laramie... Uh, the, 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 the Longhorn. Uh, lo, no, Longhorn. it's Laramie, isn't it? Longhorn. Longhorn, Longhorn is the new top-end uh, ramp. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, it's serious industrial strength, um, manly luxury. Where the Denali's well, aren't necessarily. The yeah, Denali's are... The, the Silverado leather is not a manly leather. It's this nice, soft subtle, kind of chocolate-colored one, whereas you get in the Longhorn or the King Ranch, and it's like you're sitting in a cowboy saddle. Well, like, That's what the, you know, big, fat King welts of steams and big... Absolutely exceptional. Actually, you know what? I have to say it. It's not the King Ranch interior that's exceptional. The King Ranch seats and door trim and armrest are exceptional. The instrument panel is the same old, same old. You know, you tap on it with your fingernails, and it makes that plasticky, rattly sound. But the stuff you're sitting on, and it has presence. 
Well, know. I guess we'll just have to wait for the uh, Toyota, what is it called, 1793? Yeah. Something like that. I mean, 1792. I, yeah. I, I guess we don't have to worry about Toyota uh, eating into um, big three trucks anytime well, soon. Well, you know, I say. Never say never. Never say never. Don't count that. If I you count anytime soon, Toyota never. never surrender. When you count it Toyota never gets out, up. you're yeah. basically going to be out yeah. of the game. Yeah. You just don't realize how it. About, how about their profit numbers? Oh, geez. I haven't even had a chance to go through the number. What, what, $3 billion plus for the quarter? Whew. Wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough for you, Jim? <laughs> but, you know, Toyota, I want to say. $9 billion for GM, which actually. Look at it this way. They made some money. Yes. But anyway, okay. Toyota took, I want to say, six generations of minivan before they got it right. Just about any other car company in the world would have said about generation we give two. Up. We give up. We can't do it. Well, we General don't know Motors. how to do this. GM gave up on minivans. Ford gave up on minivans. Yep. They both were right to do it because it was going to become so commoditized. They, you know, they just, and you, you'd have to have a vehicle that was the best vehicle in the segment when you launched and was still going to be the best vehicle at the end of the cycle. And I think after GM's first two minivans, they realized, you know, we don't know how to do these things. We haven't got a clue. <laughs> I mean, the plastic pig, the dust buster, right. spectacular. Yeah. I don't know. I think they got the people there who could still do one well. I, I don't think you can do a minivan well in a way that, that the modern market is going to, that you need to be competitive in the modern market. I think it's going to turn into a knife fight with Mexican groin rules. There, there's and it is not going to be pretty. There's enough room for Chrysler, uh, Honda, and, and Toyota, and that's probably right. about it. Although he is coming back, right, with the to Sedona? see how those Ford bands do. Oh, yeah. You mean uh, the Transit Connect? Mm -hmm. Oh, the, uh, yeah. the new, more passenger version of that. Yeah, and, and it's also larger. Yeah. Um, but It'll be, be a great competitor for the Mazda 5. Well, the, the C-Max was the Mazda 5 rethought, and they got right. smart enough to say, there is no market for this vehicle at the price point they have to do. You know, because think of it this way. They were looking at this thing even when they had non-hybrids in it, but you're thinking you're going to do a $23,000 vehicle, okay? I can buy a Kia minivan for twenty three grand. It's a real minivan, and there is no reward for me getting a smaller minivan in this country. There's no payoff. Yeah, in fact, I, I'm astonished we still call them minivans. Oh, they're over. The, the Chrysler minivan is longer than a Tahoe. The, the touchy feely enclave seem to be embracing the uh, C Max, though. The touchy feely green enclaves. Yeah. Well, the enclave, there's an argument that the Lambda is a logical way that the minivans evolved. Yeah. And uh, when, when are we going to see the new Escalade at the Detroit show? Yeah. Yep, sounds right. Hey, what do you guys make of uh, this announcement? Ferrari says, hey, we're selling way too many cars. we got to cut back. Well, here's the deal about that. First of all, I think it's a little late. I think when they did Ferrari World at, uh, Dubai, yeah. at Abu Dhabi, yeah. uh, you know, they are real, and, and stuff they're doing in China, they are right on the knife edge of going to the, uh, to the dark side. Of making it simply a marketing brand. Yeah, yep. so... For uh, Luca to say, oh, we're cutting back, I think you said it earlier, it's more of a response to McLaren's dead serious. Yeah, what was the number? 375. Well, last year they sold, I want to say, somebody will check it, but 7,375 Sounds right. Ferraris right. were sold. And you guys and were saying McLaren, that? I was in McLaren. Woking uh, last week, and uh, McLaren said it would build 375 P1s. So, so Ferrari's cutting its production by exactly yeah. the number of cars McLaren plans yeah. to sell. And McLaren uh, pointed out, uh, was proud of the fact that the uh, the original F1 road car, um, how limited that was, <coughs> was fewer than 100, I think it was 96 or something. Yeah, sounds right, uh, excluding the race cars. Yeah, because yeah. they did race cars right. off of it. And, uh, the most sought after one. And how much that's gone up in value since the uh, since it was available in the 90s. But that's the key, gone up in value. Right. And, and I remember meeting uh, a guy named Emilio Anchisi about 25 years ago who ran Ferrari North America, and he walked me through this whole delicate knife balance of you don't want to build one too many. In fact, you don't even want to build the exact number that will no. be bought. Far and, better to sell a thousand too few right. at their volume because right. Right. then you have a buffer in there. Well, not only a buffer, and desirability. You've got people fighting over right. those that's, cars. That's the buffer I'm fighting, talking about. and they want those cars, and they're frustrated they can't get them. And boy, that's the way to sell luxury sure. goods. But what does it what does it say about that segment and about uh, you know exclusive cars in general that uh, that that their their makers are now looking at. 
investment value from the get-go. It's not, you know, in the old days it was you bought a new Ferrari, uh, value would go down. It was a used car for a few years, and then it would go up in value eventually. You, you realize that you're equating Ferraris with uh, basically collectible Star Trek plates with only a limited number of firing days, okay? <laughs> you're you know, talking about the new Ferraris. The new Ferrari, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. Same thing. These collector's plates, not all go up in value. Well, I, but, think, I really think they have a problem. I think, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, make a big play in the China and, and new markets. And, you know, they're not that, they shouldn't be that kind of a brand. No. I mean, they shouldn't be courting anybody. Well, here's the other thing, too, is, and I think they're doing it smart. When you look at LaFerrari, is going to cost, what, north of a million bucks. Mm -hmm. As you does know, the P1, You turn the, the old sales adage on its head. Oh, we'll lose a little bit of money on each car, but we'll make it up in volume. They're going the other way. We'll cut the volume way down and make it up in pricing. I don't know. I, the, the thing, when you commoditize any luxury brand in any way, shape, or form, and you can do the, the degrees of commoditization, it's not selling automatically 375,000 Cadillacs. That is one kind of commoditization. But another is selling 10,000 Ferraris. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've had a problem with Ferrari marketing for 10 years now. Well, and, and you have to split that off, though, I think, Ferrari and, and Lamborghini and McLaren off from uh, Bentley and Rolls-Royce in that, you know, the old saw that when the economy t starts to tank, uh, rich people who still tend to be very rich may go out and buy a new luxury sedan, but they won't go out and buy something flashy like a new Ferrari. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's that distinction, and I think they're very aware of that, especially with what's But as we on. learned in the last downturn, they weren't buying anything. They, they basically put off their luxury good purchase. Well, that was, a v I hope, a very unusual... It may not and, and be. And downturn is the right word, because, look, Europe is cratering right, right. now. The, the car market there in, in Italy, you buy a Ferrari, you've got the Italian IRS breathing down your neck to see if you've not paid all well, your taxes or not. Okay, it's, it's different. <laughs> you know this new McLaren P1, by the way, you know that uh, it's an English car, and yet they're only going to build left-hand drive models. <laughs> so, no! That's right. Well, Britain's oh, got to see at that's least, not right. They see, that's not right, man. The, the Ministry of Transport. <laughs> oh, that ain't right, man. Ministry, at least half of them coming over here, obviously, and then maybe a few to Asia. Still, the Ministry of Transport has decided that this is the year they're going to do the conversion to the other side of the road in England. No. Yeah, and they're going to do it in a progressive fashion. It's small vehicles first. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is that they're more maneuverable, so they'll be able to get around easier with a change. And then at the end, it'll be the heavy good deal. Oh, it would really be good to have one of those McLaren F1s now, wouldn't it? Damn yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, did you tweet that out? Because Jim just broke some news. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what he broke. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Let's see what else is here. Hey, Peter, you had some really cool stuff on your site tonight, uh, or this week, of... The guy from Jaguar saying they ain't Saturn Andy, or, or Scion. Uh, Andy Goss, yeah, he said, you know, it was he had a, a response to a question and he was very comfortable with where they were well, at. Well, see, and, tell the background to that because somebody asked, why aren't you going after Gen Y buyers? Yeah, he said we're, you know, we're a luxury car maker, and he, he gave a long explanation, but the end of it was, we're not Scion, and I was just like, how freaking will you? That's the smartest thing I've heard in months in this business. It is, but the truth is they ain't even BMW because they really need a 3 Series competitor. And it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, but it's not going to be like a 3 Series. For God's sakes, guys, the clock is running on them. Do they really need it? Yes, they need it. Why do they need it? It's the core of the luxury market on a global basis. It is. I agree. It is the core. But it's not Scion. No, no, I, and I agree with that, but that's this point. They still don't have that car. I mean, now they had it, and the one that Ford gave them was probably the same as uh, having somebody come and give you the shingles. You know, the, Worst they, car of the last <laughs> decade, even worse than the... It was not good. So, so when you get into that position, that's pretty icky, okay? But they at least they have got to have that product. And it's one of those things, I, I think it's like uh, the people telling you, don't worry, we've got this handled, we've got it handled. And they're going to find that by the time they get it out, they're a generation out of phase. Well, at any rate, the rest of the column was about the fact that BMW and I think BMW and Mercedes are, you know, they've kind of lost it. Well, and, and this gets back to the point that you made about uh, the Jaguar guy. He was clear of what they're not. Yeah. and They're not and, Scion. And that's important because it's obvious that Mercedes and BMW marketers and product people have lost sight of what they're not. But, but, but equally important is knowing what you are. And I'm not sure they even know that anymore. Personally, I don't think they do. And one of the indicators to me is a car that I suspect is a spectacular automobile, and it's the F-Type. But where is it in the market? 
price-wise. It's, it's like they, they missed the Boxster. Well, this version competes with it, sort of. And they're around 911 pricing, and it's like, guys... My problem with the F-Type is I think it's, it's pretty cool, but it's not... They could be an island unto themselves if the F-Type was really spectacular. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's very... It's an attractive car. It's a very attractive car. It's not like if it was a jaw-dropping car, then Jaguar could say, Man, we don't care what Porsche You're right, does. but it isn't. All right. Because it's an F-Type, and it's, there's nothing else like it. Yep. Well, it's, it's very nicely done, very nicely rendered, right. but it's just you know, not quite special. Our latest, our latest cover story has uh, George Cocker driving it and comparing it with... Uh, the 911 Cabrio and, and with uh, a, an Audi um, R8 right. convertible, Cabrio. Yeah. I mean, those aren't the cars you're supposed to think of uh, as competing with the, uh, the F-Type. You would think it would be the, um, you know, the other sports car. Uh, it, it's hard to match them up. In price, it, it, it should be priced a little bit closer to a Boxster or, um, or a Cayman for well, what it is. It, that's just it. it. It's literally between time and Timbuktu as yeah. far as where it fits in the marketplace. And maybe, you know, if, if it were a car that you looked at and you passed out because it was so spectacular, that then says, okay, we can kind of create an island for ourselves there and you've got to hope their volume, they can make money at that volume. But they don't even have that. You know, and I have no doubt that dynamically it's going to be, it looks like it's going to be a very, 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 very good car. Yeah. Well, it's all, I mean, uh, the way technology is going now, I mean, you can pretty much get the technology off the shelf and it's not, it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. So it's how it's dialed in, but they needed to push that design mm -hmm. further, in my opinion. They just needed to, because then it wouldn't matter. You're right, exactly. It wouldn't matter. It's just, uh, yeah, we're not science. You know, think we, about we, we, we know who we aren't, but we, we know who we are, and we're the only ones who can do this car. They can't say that with the new F-Type, because there are plenty of companies who could do something similar. Yeah, the right car, people with taste will come to it no matter what right. their age. Right. You know? The, and, you know, you talk about Jag another way, and I talked about the 3 Series. There was a time when the thing that separated Jag sedans out from, or saloons, from any other vehicle was they looked sexy, period, end of discussion. Absolutely. Okay? You didn't buy a Jag because it had the most headroom in the segment. You yeah. bought it because it looked like nothing else out there. Now, the XJ fits that bill to a T. It is a striking automobile. Uh, there are things that I like about it, things I don't. I know all these, but it guys, stands out. It is striking. It yeah. cuts a swath. Oh. And the thing is, find me a car in the 3 Series segment that could do that, because none of them really do. The, seriously, the ATS is a, is a good-looking car. It's very nice, but it's stuff we've seen, nicely executed. The 3 Series is like a 5, is like a 7. The C-Class, very nice car, but show me one of those cars that when it comes up, you go, Got to have the it. The problem, yeah. Jim, because of what you said about how big that segment is in the luxury, uh, among luxury brands, everybody's going to be very most conservative about that segment. So if you want to, so if you want to find, I'm not saying it's right, but that's what they're. No, and I understand do. that, but because that's the case, that is the strongest argument for making a strikingly beautiful car right. in the segment. Because while you won't get the majority of buyers, it'll stand out, so everyone that goes by is an advert for it. Okay, so what would you guys do differently if you could have gotten in at? Uh, on the F car program early enough on to the X F or the F type, the F type. Oh, I would have pushed the design much, much further. In what way? Uh, much more radical point of view, like aggressive but beautiful, sexy. To me, it's it's like designer 101. You can graduate from design school, and with the right mentor, you can draw that car. Right? Yeah. But believe me, I think it's cool. It is a cool car. I mean, nice. I, I like the way it looks. Right. It's attractive. But to me, it's, it's not like the Jaguar. It's just like, oh, wow, man, no, that is cool. It's just like you were describing the sedans. Those sedans made it, yeah, they were junk compared to the Mercedes and BMW. But, but they were people, beautiful. But and they there were, was nothing else like them. Right. They're beautiful and, junk, yes. And that's what I want. They have, that's what I would, I would kept the, telling designers, I want this to be nothing like anything else. This is the, we're the only company that can do this car. Ian Callum doesn't want to or can't do retro, but you have to say, well, the, the E-Type is often held up as the most beautiful car no. built. No, you, you can't, you can't get into it. I'm saying you should you, do retro, no, but, but I mean... But what do you do then? Because as soon as you say that to a bunch of, of people, you've put a bounding... See, if you go back and look at what the E-Type looked like for its time, yeah. it was a radical road car yeah. with cues that we'd already seen on the D-Type racing yep. cars, okay? But it was a radical road car. It's why the coupe was the more striking of the two cars. Right. Then the Stingray comes out, which is equally radical and also evolved from a race car. Now, I'm not saying you do that now, but you need a car 
that first of all, you, you, the way the E-type is, I say, look at what the E-type was and look at an original E-type around the cars around it and why was it so distinctive and say, now what we want to do is a car that breaks out like that. The last car that was like that was a car that was not an especially good performing car. It was the Audi TT. The first generation Audi TT was a car unlike anything else. People loved it, people hated it, but it stood out and it had presence. And it was a design that allowed them to do a second generation car, whether you like it or not, that still said it's a TT. Once they got the badly needed uh, lip spoiler on Yeah. <laughs> but, but they have got to find that, that DNA direction for, the, for, a, for, for a Jag sports car. Well, remember the concept they had a few years ago? Yep. But it, it was suffered in a way from, from uh, retro, no, retro scolia in that it was still trying to say, I'm, an e, I'm like an E-type too Yeah, much. but I would have said that's a great place to start. Now, yep. now go take me 20 years ahead. But that's what I would have done. I would have pushed them to say, this needs to be something no one else can do. See, Instantly me, recognizable. As and, only a Jag. You don't have to put a Leaper emblem on it yeah. for people to say it's a Jag. Yeah, I wanna, but it I, is that. It is that. I mean, and maybe that's part of the problem that I have with the car. Not that I have a problem with it, but if we're picking it apart, it looks too much like an E-Type. What, the new one? Yeah. The F-Type? The F-Type. Uh, I don't think it does at all. Uh, John, I think it's time for us to get an E-Type and an F-Type and park them next to each <laughs> oh, other. Oh, no. I, it, I mean, it, it's just like the, the two like Silverados. Trucks, yeah. It's like the two. They're, they're not one panel's the same. But I look at it and I go, oh, those Actually, are the same. Actually, it's a little, uh, what was that? Short-lived Maserati, Cambio Corsa, whatever they did it. Didn't they do a convertible of that? Yeah. There's there's overtones of that. I, I don't know. I, You know, it's a very competent, nicely rendered car, but it's not to me. My my directive, would it, it has to be something where people say, did you see that new Jag? See, it's my John, do you think the car should have been done as a mid-engine car? I mean, there were, there was, were well, a lot of know, rumors to that to what Jim and Peter are saying, yeah. of that they should have really gone radically different. Yeah. I mean, where you pull up and people just drop to their knees, maybe they should have done a mid-engine car. Let me, let me tell you, the, if you look at what the E-Type was for sports cars when it came out, there was another car introduced not long ago that was conceptually similar in that it, it violated a lot of things that sports cars had. It's the Audi R8. If you look at an R8, the proportioning is unlike anything else on the road. The, tall, the roof is exceedingly tall for the forms of below, but it's functional because of it. Conversely, when you see an R8, you never say that looks like A, fill in a blank. <laughs> you don't. It's an R8. Right. And remember, underneath, there's an argument, it's a Gallardo. Well, I tell you, the Audi, the Audi R8, I had a black, black six-speed V8 two years ago, and it's still one of the best cars I've ever driven. Yeah. But the thing is, that's the kind of presence I want the, I want the F-Type to have. Well, I, I liked it better than the V10 one, because oh. I, I know you like the V10, yeah. but I like the V8. To me, it was the mid-engine Corvette that we'll never get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that whole thing about that's the kind of presence I want it to have. And, it, you know, I, see, I think you can do that with a front-engine car just as easily. Remember, if I have two identical sports cars, and one is front-engine and one is mid-engine, the mid-engine car will always be heavier. Well, but remember, you know, the definition of mid-engine is any engine between the, the front and rear axle. Yeah, but I'm, uh, the front-engine or mid-engine, mid-engine to me connotes that it's behind you, so I have two firewalls in the car. Okay, yeah. Um, so to me, were I doing that car, I would still do it front-engine, but it's like push. The thing is, the V8 is the one that I don't get in the car. It drives the price up. I'm sure the performance is spectacular, but it's like... Is that what you want for the second decade of the 21st well, century? But your sound, too. You know, an 8's yeah. always going to sound better than a 10. Yeah, we've... I'm talking about a 6. A 6, oh. right. Yep. What are the most memorable... I mean, An 8 still sounds better than a 6. We've had... Not the, necessarily. We've had this conversation <laughs> before, but think about the most memorable production designs. E-Type, the Stingray. Mm -hmm. What's, what can you name since those two cars? Well, the Audis are... are the R8 is... The R8's... Is, that's a pretty good one. It's a striking car. Yeah. And, and I'd actually put in there... What about the Gallardo? I'd put the Gallardo in there, but the Gallardo to me is, is a vehicle. I love it, but it is in some ways the antithesis of an Italian-looking car. It has this look of international design, like international architecture, where it's beautiful and very linear, and it's about design. Well, it looks German. Or, or Swiss. Yeah, you know, which is probably more terrifying. <laughs> well, it's, it's like Mike uh. Myers' Sprockets Design Studio did it. Yep. Lots of people and sleek people in black yeah. drawing stuff for an hour a day. And you see, they, they fixed that on the uh, Aventador. It's starting to look Italian again. And then they have this new, their, their supercar that looks like three cars crashed into each other and were simply cobbled together. They're, yeah, they're, 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 no. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. Even the uh, name. The, that, that looks like it should be the Batmobile. 
No, the Batmobile has more design continuity. <laughs> I like the Aventador. I think that's a cool looking exotic it is, it sports is, car. It is a very cool looking car that is in desperate need of brakes. <laughs> yeah, to me, it, there are it, brakes on it for the performance that they aim to. To me, it's, wow. it, it's as striking as the original Countach was. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's really pretty. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's more, like you said, it's more Italian, and it's, it's, it's got more of a, we don't it's care. It's a 10-year-old boy's poster car. Well, it's, yeah. it's like, we don't care. We're Lamborghini. Yeah. This is what we feel like doing. Yep. Yeah. And it looks like a Lambo. It does. Yeah. It doesn't need a badge. That, you see, that's another thing, that, that Lamborghini now, and it, it, everybody says it's because of the Mira. Trust me, the Mira for a mid-engine car was extremely conservatively designed. Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, no, no, I'm not saying it's not beautiful. It's extremely conservative. It has a long hood, right. and it didn't need it. It did not exploit the enablers of the architecture. The, uh, you you got to remember, what, when did that come out? 68? 66. Oh, 66? 66, really? Torino Jeez. show. Anyway. Yeah. And I love when Shinoda put the back louvers on the, on the Mustang in homage to the Mira. Mira. But, you, you, you know, I, I think... If you could put 1965 eyes on that, I can. I saw that. That's the first time I saw I the know, car. I know, but I, you know, it's, so I. In fact, I Jim still what, has 1965 eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> they're older than that. Usually, he doesn't have to wear glasses. <laughs> usually, you know, they're older than that, but the replacements aren't done yet. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying that you know you got to look at uh, those older cars in context, the, of in context of yeah. their day. And but, but what amazes me is when you looked at the Mira, it was not a radically proportioned car for a car that had a transverse 12-cylinder engine in it. It could have been. They never exploited the architecture, which is fine, because it's why the car's so beautiful. But you look at the cars that did exploit that architecture that came out afterwards, some of which were at least designed by one of the guys that supposedly partially designed the Mira, the Lamborghini, or the, uh, excuse me, the Alfa Romeo Carabo which was pure mid-engine. You could not have built the, car, the Carabo unless it was a mid-engine car and it screamed it. Well, the Corvette 4Runner. Same thing. Gorgeous car. I, you know, I, I told you that story when Chevy Engineering had a Mira, yeah. an orange one. No. Yeah. Really? And uh, as I recall, it was back in the Corvette, in early days of the Corvette racing team, but Jerry Thompson, who was a Chevy engineer, brought it home for a weekend. Well, the original Michelins were chewed up on it. So I go out and it's got Chevy Engineering put Firestone wide ovals or something on it and they had real thin white walls. walls. And I, you know, just off the top of my head, and then I heard Jerry say to my brother, it's just, you know, these tires are junk. This car will go 40 miles an hour faster than these tires will hand. It was just weird. Yeah. But I did get a ride in it, and it was awesome. Oh, Miras are fabulous cars. They really are. But, my God. Um, see, and, and that's the thing. That's the thing. Well, that was the car that said Lambo is not Ferrari. The first Lamborghinis, the, the 350 GT and the 400. Which I love. They're nice cars, and they're, they're beautiful. But, they, you know, they're, they're super Ligera touring design cars. They're very pretty. But there's nothing about them that screamed, I am not like a Ferrari. They had all the, the yeah. sort of visual mm -hmm. cues and the proportions mm -hmm. were like first. The, the Mira changed that. Yeah. And then they did the Marzal. And they started doing these cars that were unlike the cars Ferrari did. And that's part of their DNA. And it's why I think it's visually such a strong brand now. And they can do an international car. And they can do the train wreck that is that ball. And that brings us full circle back to what you're saying Jaguar should have done with the F-Type. Mm -hmm. They should have just... Did you know, design reach is the toughest thing there is because it's real easy to do a, you know, kind of a transition. It's real tough to do something with real reach because that's, I mean, you're hanging. It's going, that car had the longest gestation of any, any car in, its, in that segment for a long time. I mean, that thing had to be committed to death over and over, going from Ford to Tata. I mean, you know, uh, that made it even tougher, I'm sure. Yeah. Peter, you mentioned uh, Jerry Thompson. Also, this week, you wrote about GM bringing back retirees on a yeah. contract basis yeah, to help them launch. To help them launch the, uh, the new Impala and also the new truck. I mean, and I just thought of it. I mean, think of all that talent and all that knowledge. You know, the bell went off, so they had to go home. And I think GM is it's brilliant to bring them back because... It's a smart company, a genuinely smart company that does that because it's so easy to forget the guys that used to work for you. Well, well not just forget part of the, the guys, but... Part of the company is smart. That, well, I'm, but that, I'm saying that... Yeah. And, and the thing is, but 
I, I, have, I haven't written, uh, written off maybe the wrong word. the right place. So, yeah, yeah. You know. Selectively smart. Well, I, I mean, uh, if you had to choose between them being smart about engineering and smart about uh, marketing, for example, um, we, I wish they were smart about both, but at least they're smart about engineering. It's, uh, <laughs> um, it's also kind of a, a little bit of a testament to what, or a, a sign of what's happened to the business where supposedly we have shortages of, of engineers. Well, we have shortages of engineers. Uh, we have shortages of, of assembly workers. You name it, there's shortages I right think now. A, the higher the skill, the bigger the shortage. I think yeah. if companies were smart, they would take this little thing that GM's doing and really look at it and say, you know, we should bring some of these people back. Look, we let a lot of knowledge walk out the door. Let's bring some of that knowledge back but in again. Tell us the story. That's oh, what Bob Lutz has been telling him for yeah, the last yeah. three or four years, I'm sure. Yeah, but the story I like to tell about it is uh, when Ford first started building the Escape at their Kansas City plant, it got to the middle of the summer and they had this horrific explosion and fire. And the reason was they had a plastic filler neck. And, you know, as the cars come down the line, you got to put a few gallons in them so you can start them up, test the engine, drive them out in the yard and whatnot. But when the humidity's right, as this guy who stands on the line and puts in a few gallons and pulls the nozzle out of the neck and pulls the nozzle out of the neck, and static electricity yeah. starts to build out. So until one time he pulls it out, the spark arcs and kablammo. Well, they had had the exact same problem a decade earlier when they built the Tempo Topaz which, if I remember right, was the first car Ford ever had with a plastic filler. filler neck. And they, kablammo, they had the same explosion. And somebody came in there and they figured out, this is an easy fix. You take a, a thin rubber strap, you make it long enough to touch the ground, you attach it to the nozzle, it grounds out the nozzle, no static electricity arc, bingo. So when I heard of this big explosion, and I remembered the story from a decade before, I thought, yep. The guy who knew what to do had retired, and none of the new hires knew what to do. Generally speaking, in American and a lot of Western European companies, retained memory is non-existent. And the companies pay for it. And they, the thing is, it's, it's, the, it's the thing they keep paying for. And you know how Toyota solves that problem? They have the big book of answers. Yes. So every shoe saw, which is... The chief, uh, the, the vehicle overlord chief, the basically, God. yeah. The god has to keep track of everything that they ever did on the program with suppliers or in manufacturing, any little defect, any this and that and the other thing. And it all gets cross-published. And so when that SHUSA retires, and that's all you are, you're a SHUSA. That's your last job. That's your last job. So, and you go through multiple generations of cars, you hand off your big book of answers to the SHUSA who replaces you. And if he, because it is a he, ever runs into any problem, <laughs> he goes through the index, finds where the That's problem is, and it says, here's how we fixed it last time. So they do it the old-fashioned way, pen on paper. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about connected cars. Is it true that you guys said today that taxi cabs and commercial vehicles would be the first to be autonomous? Taxi cabs, I still stand by, and probably... Uh, Jim's been saying that for years. Yeah. I have, and probably, probably right. in Europe, uh, where you have very congested cities with low-speed traffic, and more importantly, we have cities where they, they, in the congested areas, they limit vehicle traffic. Now, now to give a little backdrop, you were at uh, the Automotive Press Association yeah, today with the Michelin, a panel. The Michelin-sponsored uh, thing that's basically the design challenge for Michelin for, for 2014 is about uh, driven or undriven cars. So yes. there were a bunch of designers, and you were on the panel, too, yeah. and talking all about connected and autonomous, autonomous vehicles. Cars. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it's one of those things, logically, it makes, it makes tremendous sense to have this. The problem is, as, as I've mentioned to Todd before, it's the horror of the scene in, uh, actually, yeah. one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's finest films, <laughs> uh, 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 Total Recall, where he gets into this taxi cab, and there's this mechanical thing that has a light that lights up, and it's got a cab that says, hello, I'm Johnny Cab. I mean, if they have that, God help us. But... An, auto an auto autonomous taxi makes sense. Autonomous delivery vehicles make tremendous sense because the guy on board basically becomes a, uh, a cargo master. Yeah, mm -hmm. autonomous class 8 semis. The, there's eight an argument. In, in some ways, freeways are a better environment to do them in anyway. Sure they are. Um, but, you know, and we've talked about this. John and I, we're going to see autonomous cars sooner than we imagine. I believe it totally. 
you know, we're, understand. We're, we're, on the, on the we're voyage. inching there very quickly. I mean, you know, the new Acura RLX, you can, you can let it drive itself for up to 10 seconds on a gentle curve. It'll read, because you've got the uh, lane departure control already. Right. You put the uh, Distronic or whatever they call their uh, active cruise control on. You can do that on the Lincoln MKZ. MKZ, yep. there you go. And, 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 that's, and that's just to name one car. There, they're only a bunch limiting, of them they're limiting it to 10 seconds, but enough time to change the radio station or S -class send your S-Class Mercedes text. will be the first yes. with semi-autonomous uh, well, technology. It has, the it has the capability. It has it has the capability to basically autonomously bring the car to a safe stop regardless of traffic. Where it can pull itself over with turn indicator on wherever there's the least resistance for it's, it, it'll pace itself for cars. So if the driver, for example, suddenly just blacks out, the technology in the car would allow it to do that. It's not implemented. I'm if not sure Mercury that, had this oh, a few okay. years ago, it's imagine. not implemented. See, and that's the thing. We have vehicles now that, in a lot of ways, are maybe two thirds autonomous or 50 percent autonomous. But to make them work that way, the technology has not been integrated by design. Well, what Mercedes has to do or has done is you have to keep your hands on the steering wheel mm -hmm. of this semi-autonomous car. And the reason is that in Germany, and I think this is true of most of Europe, you cannot legally drive a car if you're not totally in control of it. And that's why, because I, I, I kept telling the people at Continental and Bosch and Mercedes, <laughs> oh, it's going to happen in Germany before here because our lawyers are going to go have a field day. And they went, no, no, it's going to happen here before it happens in Europe. Which I thought was an interesting point of view. But I guess you have to, you, you could redefine what, what's total control of the car. Well, Here, I, here's, I, the go ahead. here's the thing I had, uh, this was another question, if I had had time I would have asked you guys, is that we, we have this uh, vision of what autonomous cars are going to be, and that years and years from now, once you have, everybody's autonomous, and you have uh, devoted roadways and so on, it's supposed to be completely safe. You've got zero fatalities. Uh, that's the that's the theory. In between that, we've got what John's talking about, where there's all kinds of uh, legal uh, ramifications, and and uh, you you're already starting to see some pushback on that. Well, what who who's responsible if there is an accident? What happens if uh, someone does uh, one of these cars does go out, out of control? Uh, it could happen even uh, through cyber. Uh, well, it's really easy. It's going to be the manufacturers of the technology are going to be held liable. But so here's the question. Yeah, so yeah. It's so going to be whoever has the deepest pocket. Well, hold on, and I'll get to that in a minute. So, so Google has been, has been testing these cars for four or five years now. They've got, I don't know how many cars on the road. They, they must have logged 400,000 miles. 400, miles. <clears throat> are they just doing this for validation? Are, are, I mean, no, the, the technology no, is all there. It is, but the technology develops. The software develops. Uh, understanding, ex see, a lot of this, the, the thing with the, the autonomous car that as Google started, when it started, it was an experiment. I mean, literally an experiment. They didn't know the limitations yeah, of what yeah. it could and couldn't do. Well, well they, they had a little bit of DARPA. Because, remember, they hired Sebastian Thrun, who had run Stanford's effort in the DARPA challenge. Right. And so, but that thing so is, they, they took all this DARPA knowledge. Right. Right, but they still don't know in a real-world environment because the the DARP, the last DARPA challenge, the one where they did the, it, it was its own way kind of a disaster. Okay, as far as the the, the some of the assumptions were screwy on it. Well, like, maybe, but they proved the technology. And but what Google's finding now, to the the, the specific tech uh, challenges they have with the technology is. What do you do if when there's six inches of snow on the ground? Mm -hmm. I mean, then your sensor. Right. It's, and the, the other thing that they have a problem with is going through toll booths. The system isn't exactly sure how to read that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> All I think is, well, because, I mean, Peter, you're absolutely right. Autonomous cars, there's a certain aspect of them that's inevitable. It's going to happen. And I only hope that the, the mandatory and full implementation of 100% autonomous cars where you can't drive a, a regular car on the road is after I die. Yeah. Um, I just can't believe you ran down that movie. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> My wife uh, tweeted me, by the way, that uh, if there's any problems, they'll just blame it on the floor mats. There you go. Uh, there you go. I, I wrote a, I've got a, uh, an online piece at automobilemag.com this week about, about this whole thing and about how uh, I saw the Alfa Romeo 4C up close and personal a couple of weeks ago. That car has a, uh, a, a dry clutch, or a wet clutch, rather, Automated manual, um, but it has only transmission, brake. right? Only transmission, but it has a, a mechanical, you know, ratchet handbrake. And then uh, about a week later, I was driving a Porsche Boxster that had the, the standard six-speed manual gearbox, but uh, an electronic, you know, handbrake. electronic handbrake. How I kind of wanted the two, and of course, Jim's looking at looking at me, thinking, "Oh, this is just you. You just don't like anything new." But I mean, th th these are. Th 
they provide the kind of mechanical feel that you talk about that young buyers don't know about because they learn driving through PlayStation or all they know about cars is hitting a button, which is what you're doing with a, with a DSG uh, if you're shifting it manually. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of tactile feedback. Except in, in the car you mentioned, the, the Porsche with manual transmission, you're really not shifting. There's a bunch of mechanical linkages in there that aren't allowing you to feel the gears go in the way you used to. No, but there's a, there's a well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Todd. There's rubber to isolate it. I, I, yeah, whenever there's anybody... Still, there's still a feel to it that you don't get out of a, out of a PDK. That's true, but I can drive faster with a PDK. Well, I get more G, more blood runs out of my eyes and nose. Speaking yeah. of which, John, how about telling us about the M5 you had? Yeah, I had this M5 uh, this past week, and uh, I didn't like the car, and that shocked me that I didn't like it. And, and there's two things about it. Number one is when you start it up in the morning, and I don't mean cold mornings. It sounds like an old man waking up. You've never heard so much whining and wheezing and groaning in your mind. I mean, unacceptably so in my book. You know, here's a $105,000 car or something like that. That's, that's really cool. But, man, until it warms up, it's... it's Remember what's going on with cars now. You, how many cars, new cars, you get in, you start them up, and not necessarily stone cold, but not warm. It's sat overnight. And automatically, the 12 or 1300 or 1400 RPM idle... Why? Now, that's in the cold weather. It's, it's, it's engine cold because they're doing it to preheat the catalyst. Yeah. yeah and this, remember, where's this, the... This where's, isn't even... I, I'm telling you, this is powertrain groans and whines and... Where's the turbocharger and wastegate on that car? Where is it? Between the V. Yeah. It's a reverse flow engine. So the back side of the turbo is going straight out towards the firewall. Splitting for the exhaust. Yeah, I don't know. This I'm is, serious. I think this is the noisiest car. I, I think it's powertrain architecture. Here, here's the well, other plus thing, too. Plus, the gearbox. It, yeah, and the gearbox is... Uh, now, did, you didn't have a manual, did you? No, it's one of those manumatic things. Because the, the yeah, manual... It shifted into neutral, which becomes park. Right. There's no park. Yeah. Isn't there a button on the thing? No, not... Well, I had an M3, and it was the same thing. You, you put it in neutral, and then you uh, activate the electronic parking brake. So you park it in the gear, essentially. But then when you, right. when you, I guess when you turn it off, it, the little thing goes P. And it goes P, and it says, oh, you have not put it in the P position. Yeah, it's, it's like, a button on the top of the shifter. Ah, uh, there wasn't a button. There should be, there should be uh, like a little tiny thing. No, that's in a it. standard BMW. Uh, yeah. well, it was the, but it was the twin clutch in the, um, um, in the last generation M3. The, the, the one that's about to get replaced had that with a little... No, they just had like a little golf ball kind of gear shift knob. But here's the other thing about the car is it really is a track car. But it's a four-door. Who, I mean, who wants to buy a track car that's a four-door? Commercial? We got carried away. Yeah. <laughs> here's Chip uh, telling me it's time to, t uh, to take a commercial break. And it is. So, Ben, let's give a shout-out to our friends at Bridgestone. Hey, we got a, a bunch of questions coming in from our, our viewers, so let's get to rapid fire, Ben. Okay, our first question is from AM2. He says, what do you think of Bertone's interpretation of a compact Jaguar? Bertone Jaguar B99 concept. I'm, I'm not familiar with this. No. I think I. that was the, uh, like, dark maroon sedan they did a couple of years ago. It, uh, arguably, it, it, I think it's better than the XF. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I do not like that. See, and so. the, the XF is the classic example of an anodyne car. It offends nobody, but it's like, tell me why it's a Jag. And I remember somebody said, well, it's got the leaper on the back. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the B99, it, was, it, was, it, was, it looked more like a Jaguar than the mid-market Jaguar sedan. If sized like a 3 Series, it would be pretty nice. But I would want something more. Yeah. Okay, uh, Scott in Cleveland says, will the GM vans be replaced with the Opel Movano European-style van? I doubt it. No. That's a, see, that's a joint venture vehicle with Renault. So it opens up all kinds of weird questions. And, yeah, and, like, what about your agreement with PSA? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tesla Motors at Model S asks, Tesla Motors Q1 2013 earnings. Are you going to talk about that? They made money. They made pretty good money. Partially by selling their uh, credits to other car companies. I, I want to say 12% of their revenue yeah. came from selling credits to other car companies. 
So yeah, the other thing too is, and but I, if you if you're doing build, if you're building just electric vehicles, that's part of the business model. You, hey, you can't poo poo it. That's no, and, I and agree. And if GM suddenly legit. did eighty percent electrics, they'd be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. The only thing uh, is, uh, I haven't had a chance to really dive into their reported earnings. I only saw some of the other reports on it. They reported an operating loss. So they did not make money on operations. Mm -hmm. It was probably things like these EV the, credits the, that uh, yeah. that made them their profit. So, uh, but, but I'm just saying for gonna, them, that's part of the business case. It's, I know, but you know, it's not sustainable. If your operations are not making money, it's going to catch up with you eventually. It, the company that's part of their operation is being able to have these credits to sell. That's part of the revenue stream. I'm serious. Yeah, I think traditionally you're right, John. You're absolutely correct. But we're not talking about a traditional car maker because they, the cost savings alone of not having to certify the car. And other companies have to do this. I'm serious. You're, you're going to see this could be a revenue stream for any company that has a high number of electrics that, that qualify for the credit. So I mean, why not? I mean, it's, well. you know, it. What's next? Yeah, what's next? Yeah, what's next? Uh, let's see. We got a phone call, Ben. Let's bring that in. Kind of, yeah. Hello, guys. This is uh, Chad W. from 17 miles south of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, I'll just say that I have a job that allows me to drive many makes and models of uh, new cars. And I was just wondering, uh, under wide open throttle, the Dodge Dart and the Chevy Malibu don't seem as though they are thrashing or straining like some other four-cylinder cars. Um, do you guys know of any special tricks that they're doing with these, or is this just natural evolution of the refinement? Um, thanks. Love the show. I watch them all. That's great. Um, I, I would say as far as the Dart goes, uh, it depends which engine you're talking about in transmission. My guess is it sounds like you're talking like about one of the target Tiger Sharks, the normally aspirated engine. Probably. Engines. You know, I, I find that car underpowered, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's quiet. It's just not <laughs> revving up enough. <laughs> we, we have a, a long-term Dodge Dart with the, uh, the, one with four. the dry, uh, dry clutch. And, uh, boy, uh, I drove that to the New York Auto Show, and in the city, in New York, I had to use the manumatic controls just to be able to get out of its own way. It, yeah, and, and as far as the, the Malibu goes, if it's a 2.5, the 2.5, you know, it's kind of torquey, doesn't work very hard, even at wide open throttle. So I, fours are more refined than they were just five years ago, and it's going to continue. The, look, there's no question. <clears throat> the, the powertrain refinement that we're getting today is spectacular, in yeah. my view. Plus, just remember, spectacular. that Malibu has, I believe, the, the 2.5 liter has active noise cancellation, too. Hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah. What, what else we got? Well, here's one. Uh, th th this is a recurring theme. This comes in from Brian Wolf. He says, sport bucket seats are not available in the Porsche 991 GT3. Andreas Preunger, I'm, I know I'm butchering that name, issued the following statement. Unfortunately, the sport bucket seats in the, commu in the communication car shown at the New York Auto Show do not meet applicable ho homologation regulations. Yeah. And thus cannot be offered for sale at this time. PCNA, which is Porsche Cars North America, is aware of the great, as he puts in uh, caps, great interest in this option and is working to find a solution to offer in the future. Brian goes on to say, seems strange to me. What do you think? It's airbag packaging in the, in the shell seat. There's no room in the shell seat to put an airbag. Right. Yeah. The, the same thing goes on with Audis. They've got shell seats that are great, but you can't put an airbag in them. And the, the federal test, because the Europeans have the same test. But right. they, make, yeah, make, make it clear that that's uh, U.S. versus European. Yeah, they still yeah. offer it for Europe. We just don't get it in the States because our test procedure is different and you can't pull the same number off. And he said this Andreas guy mentioned uh, it does not meet applicable homologation regulations. He says, what are homologation regulations? Side impact requirement is what that is. It's specifically the injury criteria for side impact. That's what it doesn't meet without the airbag in the seat. But, you know, he asked a good question because I don't think you can find the word homologation in the, uh, in the dictionary. And usually what it refers to is a set of rules that says you must build X number to these specifications and mm -hmm. it's usually used in racing. Gran you know? Turismo Amlegato. Yes. Yeah, right. So if you want to be able to have a car that can be raced, you have to meet certain homologation but, regulations. But the regulation also means it has nothing to do with numbers. The Federal Motor Vehicle Requirement, the FMVSS standards, are homologation criteria. You have to meet those. I never thought of it that they way, are, but you're it's, right. It's what's required to and fill in the blank. Yeah, let's see uh, what else we got here. SeaTech says, Chrysler has a mid and small car problem. No good small and mid SUVs. 
That's not all the problems I have. Well, the, the, and, and the small SUV, I agree with him. Uh, I mean, the journey really just, and it's the It's package, borderline too big it, to be a small SUV. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's like the uh, Ford Edge. Uh, it's, it's just kind of in the between. Uh, the, the, the Jeep Cherokee, the new 2014 model, uh, whether you like the styling or not, is designed to uh, solve that. Uh, the problem is they're stuck with these... Uh, Trevor Creed era Jeeps, the uh, Patriot and the uh, the Compass for now, but um, let's hope the uh, Cherokee is good enough to uh, make us forget those two. <laughs> let's hope it is that good. There's, here's a good one. Jack Tomlinson says, just saw an ad for Mitsubishi. Their main point, 10-year, 100,000-mile <laughs> warranty. The ad ended with, lease one now. <laughs> he says, somewhat mixed message, don't you think? More of a mixed message <laughs> if, you, if you consider the fact that they might not be around here in 10 years. Or, or they could be doing the most terrifying thing of all, and that's getting ready to release a 10-year lease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it boggles the mind. <laughs> On a Mitsubishi yet, yeah. Brian says, Peter, last week you wrote about Lexus's new marketing campaign. Maybe this wasn't just last week. No, uh, it wasn't. A ways back, but how long do you think it'll last, and do you see them returning to their original tagline, the relentless pursuit of perfection? You know, I don't know. They they seem to have a short attention span at, at uh, Lexus marketing. I, I have no idea how long it'll last. Um, they probably never should have walked away from that original theme line. You know, they they had a, you know, they... They launched it properly. They had a, some nice ads. Everyone remembers the champagne glasses on the hood mm. and the ball bearing going down the seams. And they walked away. And I, I pound on this all the time in my column. It's so difficult. To find one of those. To find one of those and to seed it in the consumer's minds. And then these, these, these marketing types get in there and say, well, we need to change it. I'm guessing it's because they're, they're, they're trying to show Toyota and Lexus as being more having some passionate Oh, design. well, yeah, Accio's yeah. trying to, to switch Lexus into, you know, a hip-happening performance brand. And, um, and, and those, uh, those uh, ad campaigns, like them or not, and I like them too, uh, just kind of evoke a kind of uh, uh, almost a sterile perfection. Yeah, 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 I get that, and he's trying to change that, but uh, that's, that's a tall order. It's a real tall order. Yeah. I don't care how good the ISs are, but it's going to take a the, long time. The tallest time. order might be just the fact that uh, the, the Europeans and, and the Americans have kind of caught up in quality, fit, and finish, reliability, and so on. And, and you know, they've got... And so Accio pushing Lexus into the performance arena, that's not going to differentiate them all that much. I mean, they're going to be, it's going to be me too. Oh, wait, you know, we... Well, that's the problem. Everybody at one point, it's every chief engineer for every car company wants to work for BMW. And you can tell Mercedes, you know, Mercedes was a different kind of luxury car than BMW because BMW really wasn't a luxury car. It inherited its position. No, it wasn't. And Mercedes were about refinement and so on, and they abandoned that. So Lexus picked it up. But then Mercedes is doing sort of like BMW. Audi is, they're all chasing this one Nürburgring centric sort of node for a luxury car. And there's room for something else. That's why there's room for Lincoln. People keep saying there's... Absolutely. There's no room for Lincoln. Oh, yeah, there is. But, yeah, there is. But Lincoln has to understand something about luxury that they do not understand and that no car, very few car companies do. There's a difference between luxury and technology. There's a difference between luxury and price. There's a difference between the concept of luxury and exclusivity. Luxury and the thing that make... And this, I'm, I'm, this is a hot button for me. The things that define luxury products is that they, they provide a sense of occasion. There is something about them that other things don't give you, period. The MKZ is a car that had tremendous potential to me because the outside of it is visually striking. Whether you like it or not, you notice it. Yes. The interior, when you sit in the interior of the car and you look at it, it's like a sketch. It's forms and shapes you don't see on cars. You know, now the problem is the materials aren't up to snuff. They aren't. And the other thing is that there's something in the car that if they had spent $50 corporate cost on it, corporate variable cost on it, to make it different, and it's the push buttons for the transmission. Yeah. Let me explain. If you got in the car and when you touched it, there was something absolutely unique about that experience that no one else can duplicate that feels special every time you get in the car. You have that sense of occasion, the fact that I am not driving something else. The guys who made this obvious and no luxury company understood it was Jag. 
On the XF, say what you want about the interior of the car. The handshake is, everybody knows what it is. You start the car and slowly out of the center console rises this thing that looks like the top of a can that you turn for the shifter. It's unlike anybody else's. It's entertainment. That's what luxury is about. The guys who have understood this historically have been companies that don't, that historically haven't had high-tech luxury cars, but they've been cars like a Rolls-Royce. Nothing felt like the steering wheel in a Rolls-Royce. It was as thin as vermicelli. It was hard. It had these finger ribs in it, but the way it worked in your hand, it felt like what it was supposed to do, and it was unlike anything else. And they had their organ stop air vents. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, and the know, feel of them was unlike anything in a car. These manufacturers, uh, and I touched upon my column this week, they've lost the understanding of specialness. They, in, in chasing every last niche, they've just lost their way. There's I room? mean, you, you, you touched upon it. Where did BMWs come from? 2002. Mm -hmm. it That's not luxury. It wasn't a luxury car. Right. It was the very de quintessential definition of what a sports sedan was. We didn't know what a sports sedan was. It didn't exist. BMW defined it. And, well, and Mercedes, too, was not a luxury car. I grew up in Southern California. Mercedes was an engineering car. A Mercedes was a Rolex watch before Rolex was, it was an Omega watch. When Omegas were built well, and you'd buy an Omega watch, and it would last you for 40 years. Yeah. You would buy a Mercedes because it was so perfectly engineered. It was durable and rugged. And it, did, it wasn't stylish, so it didn't go out of style. And in Southern California, when you saw the people especially in Pasadena, the people that bought Mercedes, they were not buying luxury cars. They were buying an incredible, durable good that they could depend on. Well, Merce here's Cadillac that overbuilt cars. And, you know, how many cars can you put a tuxedo grain vinyl roof on? I have never seen a vinyl tuxedo in my life. But they had tuxedo grain you for haven't. seven years. Now, I never have. <laughs> you didn't go to prom in the 70s. No, I didn't. Okay. Um, so, so with them, you had these cars that were commoditized luxury cars. And people said, well, get a Mercedes because it's just not one of those. So they, their, their position of being a luxury car was a synthetic and created position created by the U.S. market. Right. And also, it was a moment in time, one of the greatest ad themes of all time, engineered like no other car in the world. Exactly. And then they walked away. They walked away and said, you know what, it's too cold. It's too, you know, aloof. Aloof. So we are going to become approachable. The moment they decided they were doing that, they went started the long. Well, so Plus meanwhile they, you have so you have Mercedes trying to fill all the niches and and start from and niches uh, where there aren't niches. Yeah, and and start from upper middle, you know, pricing uh, up into the stratosphere where they've always been and then you've got Ford uh, just kind of the opposite uh, taking a common brand and trying to make it you know, as expensive uh, as a luxury car. Overlapping very heavily into that uh, Mercedes era. Yeah, well, my attitude. Which one will win out? Yeah, I don't know. my attitude for BMW and Mercedes is Go up market. Let Hyundai and Kia, you know, come in under you. Whatever. Go up market. But you see, the Hyundai and Kia are a good example. Those are cars, especially, I mean, you may not like the way the Equus looks, but the Equus is a car that has a lot of the things you say, oh, that's like a luxury car. But it doesn't have the sense of occasion. No. It doesn't have the entertainment. And this is something, I mean, think about it. BMW owns Rolls. They should know this. And I cannot find a more clinical car that I get into when I get into a car that is the antithesis of the things that to me connote luxury than a three or five series BMW. The screen always sort of sticking up there. At least on Audis, you start it up on an, on an A7, an A6, or an A8, and the screen does this little pirouette and appears for you. These are little tiny things. Yeah. Well, I'm amazed that BMW hasn't screwed up rolls. You know, I, I'm kind of shocked. Yeah, I don't get to drive them often uh, enough to tell you. <laughs> well, I, was out, I mean, I don't drive them at all. I was out all. in my ghost the other night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we learned something tonight, and I really like what you're saying there, Jim, of this sense of occasion. You know, I'm going to write about it, special. and I, I, it's, it's been something in my craw because it's you're, the you're, opportunity right. Lincoln has. Right, right, well, right. Well, it's the dim diminishing of specialness in everything. Yeah. The, the instant 24-7 era we live in. Nothing special anymore. We were right. talking about quality writing. Well, quality writing? No, we just need to be first on Twitter with, oh, the new, the, the new Silverado is this in 140 characters or less. Think about what you could do to make this special. Now, there are companies like Virtu that do phones that are psychotic, and then there's the, the Tag Heuer phones, and all they're doing is putting a case on it. Yeah. 
uh, you know, and it's it's that whole thing. You can do this. It's doable. They could do this at Lincoln. Right. And the thing is, they don't understand the importance of it. They don't understand the context of it. If you think about it, what was a more special occasion car than a car that they probably hear too much about? But it's a 61 Lincoln. Yeah, well, they're spending all their efforts on consumer Consumers can't tell you what Jim's talking about. And the other thing that I, I really like about what you're talking about there is it doesn't have to be high tech. No. At all. No. It has to be unique, special, and it has to make me feel good about my purchase. And, you know. And, and that's why the things like the, 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 the doors, the, the organ stop vents, it's low tech in the way they do it, but it's, it's machined so well. It feels so good in your hand. You're like, yeah. No okay. other car has it. And it's right. round. And Not it, anymore. They and, used to. And right. it ties up the show and gets back to the F type. <laughs> it does. I mean, it that's does. missing from it the F type. It's missing from the F type. They didn't sit there in with all that JAG memorabilia I'm sure they have in their design thing and just say, well, wait a minute, this is, anybody could do this car. Remember, the problem with history is that when you see it, when you see history with our eyes, with the eyes of the present, it becomes a prison. It actually does. It constrains the way you think about stuff rather than getting back and saying, what was this? Well, the new, the new Corvette, the Roadster, I think is really good. The coupe, I just, that roof, they just blew it. No, it looks very much like a, a, an R35 uh, GTR roof. Well, that's my problem. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe they... Oh, kind of, boy, am I going to hear from that. Yeah. A certain person is watching this. I'm well, gonna, I know, but they, I, I can't believe they consciously said, gee, that Nissan GTR, that's, some, that's something, something. We're going to make the new Corvette have a cue of that. It's just like, it's an atrocity. I'm sorry. Roadster? Roadster's fun. Roadster's pretty nice. The Roadster's very nice, but that coupe with that GTR homage to the GTR, really? I mean, <laughs> come on. It's a Corvette. Okay. That's right. Hey, good show, guys. This is, has been... I've learned a few things. I'm glad I'm sitting here. We've learned what the B99 is. Yeah, that's, there you go. I had to look it up. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty striking vehicle, but it's, it, I push, you have to push farther. So, Jim Hall, thanks for being on. And we should let our viewers know that coming in a couple of weeks' time, we're starting a special segment once a week on AutoLine Daily. We're calling Design Handbook. And Jim is going to be holding court and teaching us about design. So I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. And you need to plug your weekly show, too. And, yeah, you know, we were talking a lot about connected cars, uh, autonomous cars. I, we just did a, a deep, deep dive on AutoLine this week, uh, which is still on the website, uh, all about connected cars, autonomous cars, and, and where that's all going. And I've been following it a lot, especially at automobilemag.com, and I'll have stuff coming up in automobile. Cool. And you follow me at am underscore Lassa at Twitter. Cool. Great having you here, Todd. Thank, thanks. Peter, good show, man. Yeah. This is yeah. excellent. Yeah, good show. So I want to thank everybody for having tuned in, and please join us again here next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.